I mean, as if he's Hitler or Joe Stalin. Uh, we now have the internal treaty that says the third world actually has to make double the cuts, which will actually destroy their economy. They suckered the third world into getting behind it, believing they were going to get some goodies. Now they find out it's really about the IMF and World Bank further looting them. So we'll get his take on that as well. Christopher Horner, let's talk about what's currently happening and where you see this process going. And uh, then let's talk about the fraud of these individuals. Well, on the international stage, Alex, it's going uh, as expected. They have kicked any treaty or something that might be a treaty into next year. And Copenhagen will result in an historic agreement to meet again in Mexico City next year, which is how these have all turned out year after year, which is why I've stopped going. And uh, this actually was supposed to be a treaty-producing conference, but months ago we realized it was not going to be. So where it leaves us is we'll get a promise of billions. We don't know how much. The demand is over $100 billion a year just from us. And the offer on the table is something under $10 billion a year from us, which is 10 too many. They're even talking about three. Uh, to upgrade the infrastructures of countries to better compete with us as we fund that upgrade through forcing our energy users to buy ration coupons or what they're calling allowances to use fossil fuels, hydrocarbon energy here for the shackling our economy. So that, it's proceeding the wrong direction, but at least it's going slowly. Let me tell you what Mexico City is now. The Copenhagen discussion that we had all this build up for has now been kicked into next December, November in Mexico City. November 8th is when it begins. Imagine the build-up for this conference next year when our elections are on November 2nd next year, which means every Senate race has to have both candidates answer the question, will you vote to ratify Kyoto 2? Every single race has to confront that question. Every single House race must have both candidates confront the question, would you vote up or down to tell EPA they can't do this on their own? So we've got the international track. It's being delayed. We've got the domestic cap and trade. That's being delayed. That's good. The more sunshine that gets on this stuff and disinfects it, the more people see it, the more outrage they get. Well, Chris, let's not just glaze over the bombshell because I should have asked you are one of the leading experts, not just on the fraud of man-made global warming or change, as they call it, when we've had climate change for four billion years. You're one of the leading experts on the politics uh, of this as uh, well. Uh, so, so, I mean, you've been fighting this for decades. Specifically, you just said that, that, that Copenhagen is derailed. What I'm saying is you're going to see a lot of press releases. You do every December. Um, it's going to be a historic agreement to meet again next year. That's what every year has produced, every conference. And as I said, I went to a bunch of them, and they became very tiresome. They have my picture up on the wall as a climate criminal. Got the hippies following me around with cameras and everything else, stealing my trash. It really isn't worth going for them to emerge at the last hour with tears in their eyes, waving around a piece of paper declaring Greenpeace in our time. And it's just a piece of paper admitting that they will do nothing more than agree to agree next year. Now, that's a big deal because it makes it 2010, the year of Kyoto, too. Yes. 2010, the year of cap and trade. There's no reason, except Republicans are very skittish about these issues, for, which is, you know, their fault. Not, that's not my burden. Uh, that this should not be a, a campaign issue for everybody. And that includes those Republicans who voted for this, eight of them, two of them seeking higher office, by the way. Uh, as well as. Yeah, let's else. list them. Let's list who's. We got Graham doing it. Uh, we have out of office uh, the the globalist Newt Gingrich. Who are the Republicans supporting this treason? Well, there was this guy Mike Castle in Delaware who's now running for the Senate seat. Then we've got you can see a great town hall meeting where he gets his head handed to him by a bunch of Delawareans who do not blue hands. I guess what you call them. I don't know what their name is. Uh, who do, did not care for this? I mean, it was a wonderful moment. The look in his eye. He says the easiest job in the world until they started paying attention, and he voted for one too many tax increases. This being the biggest tax increase cap and trade in American history. Then you've got this guy, Mark Kirk, who's running for the Senate to replace uh, this Roland Burris, Barack Obama's old seat. Uh, he's a Republican from the North Shore who said, well, I voted in favor of cap and trade because it, it satisfied the narrow parochial interests of my wealthy district, but I would vote to represent the whole state of Illinois. Well, I can't respect that kind of dance. That's just insulting. And, you know, I don't know why that's any better than a, a liberal who's going to vote that way anyway. So is he, apparently. Uh, there were six other Republicans. There's a guy, Leonard Lance, in New Jersey, who put on his website, excuse me, some people put up on their websites his constituent mail, in which he boasts, oh, hey, 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 don't worry. This is actually a wealth transfer from most of the rest of the country to the coastal elites. He said it moves money from Ohio and, and, and Pennsylvania and Missouri out to New Jersey and California. It does. Yeah. So we 
we've got people who, frankly, you know, I won't miss them. And, well, they're uh, pirates, but there's also uh, some other people in the Republican leadership supporting it. Well, Lindsey Graham is the only – well, okay, here's our problem in the Republican Senate. Lindsey Graham is, according to people in South Carolina, vying to be the Secretary of Defense because Robert Gates is on his way out. And to do so, he's ingratiating himself with the Obama administration by pushing cap and trade as a bit of a proxy for John McCain, who even this time is not supporting it. I say yet, but at least he's not supporting it. So Graham's working with uh, John Kerry and Joe Lieberman to find uh, tripartisanship on this. But Graham brings no one with him. And he's considering himself not even running for re-election, as I understand. I could be wrong. The guy I'm more upset about is Judd Gregg, who's done nothing publicly, but quietly from Senate sources, I understand, is making noises about wanting bipartisanship, Uber Alice. So it's, it's more important that we find bipartisanship than what really is in the bill. You know, we're seeing that. The on country is plunging into a double-dip recession, into possible depression, and... We've got a globalist world government agreement, according to Ban Ki Moon and Herman von Rompuy, the head of the EU. It openly gives 2% taxes on GDP, taxes to foreign banks, IMF World Bank to run it, a global UN authority over air travel. This will annihilate our economy, and we've got senators who are for it because it's a new tax. Yeah, we've got people who really. They've been there too long. Judd Gregg's retiring, and he's generally a decent, as far as these things go, member of the Senate. But um, he thinks that bipartisanship before he leaves is very important. Uh, I disagree. This is the biggest tax increase in American history. The president said that the purpose of it was to cause your energy prices to, quote, necessarily skyrocket. That's not a side effect they're working on. It's the point. He's admitted this. He said well, what about Maurice America. Strong's quote in 1992 about it's our job to destroy the industrial society? Maurice Strong, you know, he, that was his fantasy of a, a, a novel character, but that's actually how he feels. I've testified next to him in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and you'd never know. The, I mean, he's this very unassuming-looking man who holds these terrible anti-population, anti-growth, anti-development views that are pervasive among the people pushing this energy rationing scheme. Isn't so, this really all about eugenics? At the bottom line, a bunch of control freaks want to be able to decide literally what you eat and what you do and how many kids you have. All about? No, but I will say this. The population zealots, the pro-state, the pro-tax, the anti-growth, the anti-development, anti-property rights, the persistent communists, the fallen communists, they're all on this. So I can't say it's all about that. The global governance types love it. They're all – there's a bunch of rent seekers, GE, Duke Energy, Exelon. They're all looking to pick your pockets in the name of – No, no, I understand there's a giant ship of pirates, but at its core from my research, the rationale of the big elites supporting it is we got to cut off people's energy – I mean, look at the communist Chinese last week saying, we'll sign on to this if you have a global one-child policy. Right. In fact, China even, I think it was a year, no, two years ago in Bangkok at one of these negotiations, said that they wanted to sell us carbon offsets. I have this in Red Hot Lies, by the way. No one else has covered this except one public source where I found it. The Chinese proposed getting carbon offsets recognized under Kyoto to sell Europe and us derived from their coercive family planning policies. What they said, Alex, was our emissions are now at X, and they would be at, you know, 1.9X if we didn't have our policies in place. Therefore, these are emission reductions. They're not. They're emissions avoided by uh, rather uh, cruel totalitarian policies, but uh, they wanted carbon offsets. And the UN, uh, this, this group that runs Kyoto, the UNFCCC and the Europeans, thought that was a wonderful idea because that's really what a lot of people are in this for encouraging. Of course, there's no doubt. Uh, but there's not a universal motivator. Remember, Enron got this thing going. I know this because I worked for Enron at the time. In 97, they told me it was my number one priority to get a global warming treaty internationally, exempt India and China because they were building coal-fired power plants there. Oh, is that how you woke up, Christopher? That's how I got into this. Yes, I was innocently practicing law, and they told me that I was director of federal government relations for Enron for about three weeks, and they told me to do this, and I told them to do something else, and I, we parted ways. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, that was my eye-opening experience. I wasn't aware that these things actually went on, believe it or not. Well, you're an amazing guest. I'm really impressed. I mean, uh, when we get back, I want to talk about Red Hot Lies and how you pegged them as how, how the alarmists use threats, fraud, and deception to keep you misinformed. I mean, you knew a year and a half ago when you were writing this, it's been out for a year, that this is a group who knowingly are engaged in fraud. So let's look at the scientists themselves then. You talk about GE and big banks and big corporations wanting it to pick pockets. You talk about the UN wanting it. You talk about the uh, no-growthers, the eugenics.